Yield to up, stocks are down. On the S&P, we're down about nine tenths of one percent this morning. Good morning, good morning. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Live from New York City, we begin with the big issue, the tug of war over financial conditions. The easing of financial conditions. Most of that occurred in equities. Markets are completely ignoring Fed speakers. Even the, the most dovish of Fed officials have been very hawkish. They're choosing not to listen. Financial conditions have uh, eased way too much. Ultimately, it's complicating what they need to do. We have these whipsaw events. This big tug of war. The payroll's dead and then the inflation prints. But at the same time, you've got weekly jobless claims moving higher. The empire number. A lot of these cross currents which are sending big signals. With 8.5% inflation, the playbook is very very, very different. The roadmap is let's tighten a lot. The market is not listening. They're not really hearing the message. There's a tug of war that's going on. Let's talk about that tug of war. Joining us now is JP Morgan's Elise Ossenbar and Academy's Peter Cheer. Elise, I want to come straight to you. It is a wall of doubt colliding with this market rally. Pretty much everyone we're hearing from this morning is saying don't chase it. Are you saying the same thing? We are. I think when it comes to the Fed and thinking through this recent tightening in financial conditions, we have to remember that that's the opposite of what they want to see. And they've really de-emphasized de forecasts and are very much living in the now. To boot this labor market resilience, I think together added with the loosening of financial conditions could potentially galvanize the Fed's hawkishness because we all know that their objective is not just to bring inflation down, but to keep it down. And so as such, we don't want investors giving their hopes up about, you know, a meaningful dovish pivot come September, at least not until we hear more uh, coming out of Jackson Hole next week. And so we're approaching this market rally, um, you know, as a welcome reprieve, but very much with caution. Well, you're not alone. This morning, we're down by nine tenths of one percent on the S&P. Off the lows of June, we're up by about 17.5%. And here's the pushback from City, who say we would say that tactically selling into further strength is justified. City aren't alone. Here's UBS and Mark Hayfully this morning. One more favourable inflation data takes some pressure off the Fed to hike rates aggressively. Talk of a policy pivot is premature. We would caution investors against chasing this rally. Peter Cheer, are you on board with that theme? Yeah, generally, we've been trying to trade this with options from both sides. Just you see things like these meme stocks coming back. So it's very hard to stay in front, you know, step in front of the freight train that's been going higher. I would say all else being equal now, I want to turn more bearish. I think we're going to get Fed minutes that push down on it. And two things that I'm watching, though, on the data front is this inventory build concerns me. And we saw in Chinese data that their exports plummeted, which tells me that that confirms we've built up too much inventory here. And that's going to be a problem in the coming months. Peter, are we working through that inventory story already? We heard from Target a little bit earlier this morning. We'll talk about that later. But what's your early take on that? I think we are just starting to it. You take a look at some of these companies that IPO. There were grill companies. There are all sorts of companies that made basic things. They IPO'd in the last year. They're all down anywhere from 50 to 80 percent. So I think we have not yet seen this capitulation where people really have to discount things. And I think that's coming. Futures down off the back of some of the retail sales numbers this morning. We're down about 1% on the Nasdaq. On the S&P, we're down about nine-tenths of 1%. Let me be clear. It is not just the retail sales number this morning. It's about an upside surprise on UK CPI and a monster move at the front end of the yield curve in the UK. Yields higher in the UK, in Germany, in the US, on Treasuries. Ten-year yields up by around about six basis points on a two-year up by seven. I want to touch base with Mike McKee to break down the number. Mike McKee, you said it repeatedly over the last couple of days. It will be about retail sales X gas. What do you see? Oh, that's pretty much it, John. The interesting thing is almost all the gains in the core sales and in the headline come from non-store retailers. That's not broken down by product category, but it does suggest that people went back to the Internet to go shopping in July. Department stores and other retailers that would sell back-to-school stuff didn't do so well. So it'll be interesting to see how the Fed interprets it. Now, uh, we have said over the past couple of weeks that the bond market and even the stock market are going to be all about volatility. You take a look there. Uh, this is what now is probable from the Fed. They're going to raise higher than the market thinks, and they're going to stay there for a longer time. That's the issue at play for the market is uh, what do they think the, uh, market, uh, the Fed is going to do? You look at uh, what the Fed's accomplished so far. Mortgage rates went up. 
And then we saw home sales significantly drop. You can see home sales and refi just died. But look what happened in about June on the right-hand side there. That was when the uh, mortgage market started to roll over a bit. Rates came down some. And that's because as the stock market went up and the bond market went up, they suddenly shifted uh, directions as well. And so where do we go from here? Is the market going to drive the Fed or is the Fed going to drive the market? I think we're going to find out next week when Jay Powell speaks in Jackson Hole. Mike, by saying that, is that a suggestion we won't find out later today in the Fed minutes? How useful are those Fed minutes? I don't think they're going to be particularly useful because they were uh, now almost uh, three, four weeks ago. And at that time, we hadn't even had the good jobs report, let alone the decline in inflation and all the other numbers that we've had since then that make it really hard to get a reading on this economy. So whatever they were thinking, three or four weeks ago on the 27th of June, uh, they've probably had to refine that by now. Mike McKee, thank you, buddy. Let's catch up a little bit later. Mike McKee there breaking down the economic data for you. Nice upside surprise on retail sales as you strip out the gas story, as Mike McKee has done. Evercore talked about this tug of war, this battle over financial conditions earlier this week. This is what they said. Right now, the Fed is losing. They will look to regain a better grip at Jackson Hole, starting with the short rates path. Investors in risk assets are still short a call to the Fed, though the strike price of the call inches up with better inflation news. That's Evercore's take. At least I want to come to you on this. Just how big is the disconnect between what the Fed is telling us and what the market is pricing? And how do you expect that disconnect to be reconciled, to be resolved? I think we should expect things like market pri price Fed fund futures to continue to be very, very volatile with every major data release. Again, I would emphasize the Fed is living in the now. They have very much deviated away from giving us meaningful forward guidance. And so to the extent that we can pick apart any clues that we might get from incoming inflation data, retail sales anecdotes, et cetera, um, I think the market will continue to do that. But all in all, we think that the market may be a little over its skis in terms of how soon it's expecting the Fed to start cutting rates. We think that could be as late as the second half of next year, not the first half of next year. So at least with that in mind, how and where would you fade this market rally over the last couple of months? And it's not just been equities, credit spreads, high yield, aggressively tighter over the last eight weeks. We are very much digging in our heels and continuing to emphasize defensiveness and quality in portfolios. This market rally has certainly been a welcome reprieve, but just below 4,300, even if you take the market at its word and assume you know, $244 of earnings for next year and an 18 times multiple, there's not a whole lot of upside from here. Um, my grandma always said that the best time to prepare for rain is while the sun is still shining. So we think investors can use this rally to de-risk a bit, consider rotating into higher quality uh, allocations like core bonds, adding to those positions to the extent that it'll allow them to stay on track towards their goals. Elise, I'm going to continue the conversation you and your grandma have with Peter Chair. Peter Chair, high yield spreads are at 413. Is the sun going to be shining on high yield at year end? I certainly like the double B part of high yield. I like investment grade credit as well. I think we are going to see this shift where people want yield. So long duration bonds should be interesting. I think the weaker end, the triple C's have had a great run between that and leveraged loans. I think there's something you want to take advantage of this really nice rally and sell down. You want to be in core fixed income. You want to own investment grade. You want some duration. I think you're going to see people continue to buy yield products, even the equity side. I think you've got opportunities to play in yield type equities. And at the other extreme, I like emerging markets, because I do think the Fed is actually going to have to stop the hiking sooner than later. And the market is priced in way too much of a soft landing scenario. I think we're still much more likely to see a hard landing, and that's not being priced in right now. So, Pete, that's a important note. There's a difference between the weakness being avoidable and the weakness being delayed. Do you think the weakness is being delayed, or do you think people are just ignoring what you're seeing? I think we're already seeing more weakness and we're kind of ignoring some of it. Even on the jobs data, right, we keep talking about the establishment number, which is the headline. There's now a almost two million difference over the past four months between the household and the establishment data. So there's all sorts of pesky little things that are bothering me in the data. I think we could see much greater weakness in the next two months than is expected. And some of that's probably already there and is not being picked up well. Well, I'm just struggling to get a clean read on things, Elise. Pete's seeing maybe some weakness in the U.S. economy. I see some strength in payrolls for a moment, though I take Pete's point. It's an important one. And then you see empire manufacturing, tremendously weak, then CPI softer. And from one data point to the next data point, the narrative sh seems to shift from a weak economy to a strong economy, to a Fed that needs to do more, to a Fed that needs to do less. Where are you on this U.S. economy right now, Elise? 
This is the big debate, right? I mean, we are calling the odds of a recession happening in the next 12 months still a coin uh, flip for this very reason. I wanted to tag on on the conversation around yield seeking behavior as well, because given some of the you know strain that we're anticipating within the high yield space, for those kinds of investors who want that higher income generation, we would much prefer that they look somewhere like the preferreds market, where you're getting investment grade quality issuers um, and also you know a touch of duration while still getting that meaningful pickup over. Over IG. Equities down this morning by eight tenths of one percent. We recover just a little bit. Yields are higher by six basis points on a two year, 332. Yields at the front end just creeping higher over the last month or so, last couple of weeks, given where we were in the middle of June. Just remember that yields peaked two days before the equity market bottomed on a two year at about 345. Then yields faded, real yields faded, and the equity market was off to the races. More recently, Yields are starting to climb just a little bit again at the front end. Your two-year up six basis points to, let's call it 332. That's the price action. Elise and Pete are going to stick with us into the opening bell. Let's get you some movers. We can catch up with Abigail. Hey, Abby. Hey, John. Well, we actually have some breaking news crossing the Bloomberg terminal not so long ago. The red head that Genesis, the privately held digital asset prime broker brokerage, the CEO, Michael Moore, is stepping down as the crypto broker has slashed its workforce by 20%. They were stung by exposure to the bankrupt hedge fund Three Arrows Capital and, of course, the broad market uh, downturn in the crypto space. And it's interesting if you go to their website, it sort of looks like they're preparing to go public. There's lots of links to the SEC and FINRA and SIPC, uh, that sort of thing. So it's going to be interesting to see whether or not that happens. But again, uh, Michael Moore, the CEO at uh, Genesis, the privately held crypto broker, uh, has stepped down as they slash their brokerage. As for some of the big movers, we, of course, are looking at earning and earnings and starting out with low. The better than feared results have created a bounce. The CEO, of course, said that the sales trends are improving and they see earnings at the top end of the range, stock off of its highs, but nonetheless higher. Target, on the other hand, uh, down by about 2.8 percent. They missed the lowest estimate, saying that the rebound is coming, but their profit continues to be hit by slashing prices to move that inventory out. As for big tech, John, you know that we, of course, have yields higher on the day. That is hurting Microsoft, NVIDIA, and other big tech giants. This making uh, valuation uh, more expensive. These stocks look more expensive as yields go higher. NVIDIA also B of A out with an interesting idea that last week's bearish pre-announcement helped, but NVIDIA would be helped out even more if they cut guidance again that would, quote unquote, clear the deck. Abby, thank you. Coming up, Target signals the inventory pain might be coming to a close. Every single company is, is talked about the fact that whether it was from late May or early June till mid-July, there are pressure points. Also, don't forget, we have a lot of inventory. The story on that inventory, I'm next. single company is, is talked about the fact that whether it was from late May or early June till mid-July, there are pressure points. The consumer stops spending. That consumer who basically is below $100,000 income was pressured by rising gas prices. What I'm still hearing from retailers is there's still a mismatch and we're still going to have certainly more goods available in September or October for these off-pricers to benefit from. I love Dana Towsey, but that Jackson Hole promo is killing me. I think it was Kelly Lines earlier this morning who said it looked like a promo for the Avengers in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Anyway, that's Kelly Lines teasing me a little bit earlier this morning. Equities are down eight or nine tenths of one percent. That was Dana Towsey on Target. I want to talk about Target right now. The numbers fall in well short of profit estimates, slashing prices to offload unwanted inventory. The CFO, though, signaling the worst might be behind them. He said the following, the vast majority of our inventory right sizing costs have already been incurred. We feel really good about our inventory position heading into the back half of the year. Let's get to Taylor Riggs for more. Hey, Taylor. Inventory, John, for some of the retailers, of course, a key focus. So is, as we talked even about Walmart and Home Depot yesterday, sort of cutting guidance and then coming into this print with lowered expectations already. That is that push-pull narrative that we have in some of the other big movers that we see today, Lowe's. Target as well. Remember, Lowe's, I think, had cut their guidance back in June, actually then managing to beat those. Target, as you mentioned, a little bit of a different story. As we're talking a lot about inventory today, 
and if there was enough of a cut, enough of a markdown to really set you up nicely for the back half. And that's the big debate amongst analysts on the street. Is another cut coming or did we really put all of those inventory issues behind us in the first half of the year? There is no better way to talk about inventory than to talk about margins. We had talked a lot about sort of the deflationary, disinflationary effects of writing down some of those prices to clear out that inventory. Inventory actually rose last quarter, so that was one big concern. And in order to clear that out, you're taking some cuts on the top line, doing those markdowns, and that was a big hit that you see to have the margin story on the right-hand side of the screen. We've talked a lot about big box retailer, John, with the Walmart, with the Target. How do we sort of match up? You are looking at maybe price hikes, not so much of a factor here at Target. Same store uh, comp sales, you're still up about 2.6% here for Target. Transactions are up. The average ticket, though, not rising as much. And that maybe is some of the pressures that we continue to see on that margin story. But again, I think going forward, the big story, John, is how do we sort of clear this picture out and get some of this strong visibility in second half of the year? Hopefully we're getting some of that right now. Taylor Riggs, thank you. Awesome from Taylor, as always. We had a cut to the outlook from Target in May, had another one in June. And you just get the feeling that maybe this morning this story is starting to become well priced because when we had negative surprises from Target in the past, you had a collapse in the stock. I think it was back on May 18th, that stock dropped about 25% on that outlook cut. This morning, on a big downside surprise on EPS, we're down just 2.9%. Is the future going to be better? I want to go back to that quote. The vast majority of our inventory right-sizing costs have already been incurred. We feel really good about our inventory position heading into the back half of the year. Peter Cheer, your thoughts on this one? You mentioned it briefly about 15 minutes ago. Do you feel really good about the back half of the year? Not at all. I think it really comes down to if you believe the consumer spending was a function of high gas prices, inflation, and that they can come back, great. If you think it was the fact that we had stimulus, that you've seen massive wealth destruction, whether it's in housing, whether it's in your portfolios, whether it's in crypto, I think the wealth effect is big. I think there's far less money floating around the system. So I think people are gonna have to continue to adjust to a weaker consumer who is not spending as much, regardless of what happens to gasoline prices. Pete, you saw that news on Genesis about 20 minutes ago. Abby broke it down for us. You've talked a lot and wrote a lot about the wealth effect out of crypto. Pete, is that still unrealized for you, for many people, just from the conversations you have? Yeah, I think it's still unrealized because people have been trying to still trade this, make their money. They've seen this wealth, but we're back above 23,000 on Bitcoin. So I think people are holding out. But what concerns me is, A, if that continues to go down, which I think it will, you have more wealth destruction. But also it's the jobs that are being lost. And these companies are starting to focus on earnings. So their ability to buy new rigs, new systems, pay service providers is going to decline. And I think that's a part of the economy that has not been captured ever before because we've never had something like that. So that to me is where this risk is that we're actually going to see an exponential slowdown and it's going to be driven from these areas that many of us have poo-pooed or ignored. And that wealth effect that was there and these disruptive stocks, these companies, their employees are hurting, the jobs are not as good as they were, and the companies themselves are going to have to reduce spending. And that, to me, I think is where I'm very different from what other economists are seeing in terms of the next few months in this. These are blind spots for a lot of us. Elise, looking at the consumer situation, we go full circle. Trying to get a read on the consumer, I think it's tremendously difficult. When you look at a retailer experiencing inventory problems, that's very different to saying the consumer is weaker if the consumer is just transitioning from goods to services as we work our way out of a pandemic. At least, does that confuse your approach to what to do with the consumer story in the equity market and more broadly to get a gauge of where this economy is? Not necessarily. I mean, we know the consumer does not feel great right now, but what we do know is that relative to you know what you might expect during periods of dire stress, the consumer seems to be holding up just fine. That said, we are not super constructive on the consumer discretionary uh, sector. Instead, we would prefer exposures to areas that have more exposure to things like corporate spending, particularly CapEx, if we're looking at something like the technology sector. But all in all, especially with how strong the labor market still is, even as we kind of see these little tiny cracks starting to form, uh, when you look at things like um, initial unemployment claims, you know, the, the picture for the consumer still looks generally OK uh, when we're taking it in aggregate. Would you maintain a U.S. bias then to your approach with markets on a global basis? Would you maintain a U.S. bias? We would. We, we think that the macro risks in Europe in particular are 
uh, much more elevated than they are in the U.S. And of course, China, with everything going on there, um, continues to be, you know, relatively an area that we're approaching with caution. So the United States, as generally and historically a more defensive market, continues to be our kind of highest conviction region uh, from a global perspective. Pete, final words. Would you agree with that? No, I think I'm looking a little bit more for Japan. I think some of this uh, tension that we're seeing in Asia is going to actually help Japan. I might look a little bit at emerging markets. You're seeing growth there. And then finally, I'm desperately waiting for the chance to buy Europe. It's not there. I'm paying very, very close attention to the big national banks in Europe. And if those start turning around, whether it's the Deutsches, the Sockgens, the UBS of the world, I think that could be a real key for growth and a big opportunity because those stocks have been beaten down so badly. AP, awesome to catch up. Peter Cheer there at Academy, alongside Elise Ossenbar there of JP Morgan. Here's a story that we're all trying to stay on top of after Elon Musk apparently joked about buying Manchester United Football Club. We can tell you, and this is a real headline, that the Glazers are said to be open to a sale of a minority Manchester United stake. So I'll repeat that. The Glazers, the owners, the current owners of Manchester United are said to be open to a sale of a minority Manchester United stake. Of course, the timing of this story is pretty interesting considering the joke from Elon Musk was about 12 hours ago. Going to bring you an update on that story around the opening bell. A little bit more still to come. The morning calls are next and later Keith Lerner of Truist on why the upside from here for him is limited. That conversation coming up shortly. This is Bloomberg. Four minutes away from the opening bout this morning. Good morning to your futures down about eight tenths of one percent on the S&P, negative about one full percentage point on the Nasdaq. That's the price action. Here are your morning calls. First up, Credit Suisse upgrading Apple to outperform, highlighting competitive advantages, including its large customer base. That's stock negative about four tenths. Deutsche Bank downgrading Stanley Black and Decker to hold, seeing multiple headwinds to the company's second half forecast. And finally, Argus downgrading Yum Brands to hold, signing valuation and margin concerns following the company. Company's quarterly results. That stock is down by 1.4%. Coming up after rallying 17% and some from the June lows, Keith Lerner at Truist says the upside here is limited. We'll catch up with him in about four minutes and we'll get you the latest on Manchester United. And no, it's not about Elon Musk. It's about some real news and we'll do that in just a moment. This is Bloomberg. Four seconds away from the opening bell in New York City this morning. Good morning. I promised you the update on that Manchester United story. I'll get that in a few minutes' time. Got into the opening bell. Futures negative nine tenths of one percent on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, down about one full percentage point. The story in the bond market, off the back of the data, is the story in the equity market. There's your opening bell. Switch up the board and get to the bond market. Yields higher. Retail sales, ex-gas punchy, decent. CPI in the UK, double digits and yields up six or seven basis points. Your 10-year, 287.31. Yields flying in the UK. In the euro, in the FX market, euro dollar negative about a tenth of 1%, 101.64 and crude up six tenths of 1%, $87 a barrel. Let's get you some moves around the open. Here's Abby. Well, John, we are looking at a little bit of a rougher start here for stocks, as you were just outlining, that S&P 500 itself down about nine tenths of 1%, the worst day in about three weeks. And a lot of this has to do with selling in big tech. This, of course, as yields are higher, that's pressuring big tech stocks from Alphabet to Intel, among others, as valuation concerns come back into the forefront. We also have Target down, down 3.7% this after. They put up a somewhat a disappointing quarter. Uh, it was a mediocre quarter. They missed profits weighed on by slashing prices to move inventory. The CEO, of course, is talking about a rebound, but investors not looking at that today, especially after Walmart yesterday beat those lowered estimates. And then TJ Maxx companies, TJX companies, down 1.2%. They cut the full year forecast. They saw inflation weigh into sales. It seems as though the treasure hunt did not happen happen in the previous quarter and maybe it won't be happening as much as had been expected for the rest of the year. John. Abby, sit tight. We'll be back to you in just a moment.
catch up on Manchester United. Let's get to those retailers just briefly. Let's get to Taylor Riggs for more. Hey, Taylor. Yeah, John, as you can see, they're a falling a target, of course, the big one, as we've talked a lot about the inventory right down the pressure on the margins. Analysts wondering if really that can continue in the second half of the year or if the worst is indeed behind us. You talked about Lowe's as well, um, TJ Axe, some of the TJ Maxx companies. So a little bit of some downside here uh, on this opening bell. We talked about some of the retail problems everywhere, and I think today, giving the retail sales numbers that we got this morning, a good time to really digest the Walmarts, the Home Depot, the Lowe's, the, tar the Target, as we've been talking about. And it, frankly, is just sort of big picture, doesn't look wonderful. We've talked a lot about the margin misses, the full year EPS drop, when it comes to Walmart, Lowe's, of course, some of those same store sales falling a little bit short, and then some of the full-year cuts that we've talked about with TJX. All in all, though, from the big rebound off of some of the gains of mid-June, it really has been discretionary that's leading it up, up about 30 percent. They say that the market will lead, in many instances, some of the fundamentals. In this case, that could be it. Not quite some of the staples, though, that you do wonder with some of the grocery business, if a little bit of that is pivoted to the staple sector as well. Hey, Taylor. Awesome. Looking forward to the coverage at a close with Taylor Riggs and her team a little bit later on Bloomberg TV and on Bloomberg Radio. Here's another retailer with a bit of a difference, Bed Bath & Beyond, extending a monster rally. This is the stock intraday, up 40%. Kelly Lyons, I've lost count. Where are we now over the last couple of weeks? Well, we've seen the stock up 15 of the last 16 days. And over those 16 days, the stock is now up more than 500%, John. Literally for no good reason at all, other than it once again has caught the attention of meme traders. They love to say to the moon, but this actually is so astronomical. It's borderline insane. According to data from Vanda Research, the retail trading crowd has pushed $99 million into this stock since July 26. Even as you have analysts downgrading it, saying this valuation is not realistic and the risk reward looks unattractive, they're paying that absolutely no mind. And it's true, too, for other former meme favorites. The likes of GameStop and AMC have been seeing more activity as well. And a collective basket of meme stocks is now up for the fifth week in a row. A return of speculative areas of this equity market that we thought would be left for dead in an environment in which the Federal Reserve is tightening policy, and yet that has proven once again not to be the case. And of course, that leads me to the fact that there are losers uh, to this trade as well. Some of them on the other end of it, the wrong side of it right now, those short sellers feeling the squeeze in a massive way. Just take a look at the short interest on Bed Bath & Beyond. 44%. That's got to be burning right now, John. We're doing this all over again. Hey, Kaylee. Yeah. Exciting times. Kelly Lights. Thank you. Difficult times if you're a Manchester United fan and complex time if you're a Manchester United investor in the last 12 hours or so. The Glazer family signalling interest in selling a minority stake in Manchester United. That's actual news. This coming hours after Elon Musk joked about buying the team and tweeting, quote, I'm buying Manchester United. You're welcome. Following up with this is a long running joke on Twitter. I'm not buying any sports team. Abby, the latest reporting from us away from Elon Musk is anything but a joke. Yeah, John, this is really interesting, this story and these headlines breaking not so long ago that the Glazer family would consider selling a minority stake in Manchester United. Uh, people familiar with the matter saying in the Glazer family, of course, they uh, recently, uh, one estimate, putting the family at $4.7 billion uh, worth. They own a lot of real estate, commercial real estate, and, of course, sports teams, including this minority stake in uh, the Manchester United, along with having bought the Tampa Bay Buccaneers back in 1995. So they are in this big time. But when they took this stake in Manchester United, as you know, it was a bit controversial. But what makes it so interesting are these tweets from Elon Musk over the last 12 hours, as you said yesterday, really doing what he does best, creating a stir, the world's richest person, tweeting that he was buying the English soccer team, Manchester United. Then somebody asked if he was serious, and he, of course, said, no, this is a long-running joke on Twitter. I'm not buying any sports teams. Manchester United, though, is higher right now now up 4.1 percent. At one point, though, uh, it had been up 17 percent on this. Elon Musk also saying, as you said, stand up is my uh, side hustle. You know, this Musk factor is just really so interesting here. And it's also really interesting to think about this, John, because he, of course, has had scuffles with the SEC in the past about market moving tweets. So, again, that stock was up 17 percent. There's not a big short interest on it. But if you were short, you might be upset about that. Plus, he has the upcoming litigation over Twitter. 
Uh, it's really interesting, though. You have to take a look at Tesla, John, over the uh, since the IPO in, uh, since in 2010, up more than 27 percent. He clearly has no fear, but it's going to be interesting to see what does happen with the Glazer family being interested in selling its minority stake in Manchester well, United. Two very, very separate stories. And, Abby, thank you for that. As for Elon Musk, joking about buying a public company, even if it is a sports team and it's Manchester United, and then waiting a few hours to tell you that it was a joke is probably not particularly helpful. The Glazer story, though, is fascinating. We already know there's a big American interest in the European football scene and in the Premiership specifically, with the latest being Todd Bowley taking over Chelsea. Just as price is concerned, remember that the Chelsea takeout was about 4.25 billion sterling. What we know from our story is that Manchester United could be valued at about 5 billion sterling, so 6 billion US. If you're looking for some details, and I'm sure as a general interest story or as a Manchester United fan, you'll be interested in whether the Glazers are looking to get rid of control of the club. And we understand that they are not. I'm going to go through the story for you. The owners have held preliminary discussions about the possibility of bringing in a new investor, according to people familiar with the matter. The American Glazer family is not yet ready to cede control of Manchester United. So that's why we're talking about selling a minority stake. That stock is up by a little more than 4%. I want to get back to the broader market because I know some of you don't like football and call it soccer. Your equity market is down six tenths of one percent on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, we're down about eight tenths of one percent. Keith Lerner of Truist says this. The case for a new bull market is much less clear than the setup coming out of 2020 and that market low. Currently, we still view the near term risk reward as less favourable. Let's get to Keith for more. Keith, awesome to catch up. I wouldn't call you a bear. You're certainly not that. You're looking for more upside here, but you think it's limited. Just walk me through your thinking. Sure. And first of all, great to be with you, Jonathan. You know, if we take a step back to, to mid-June, back then we were urging our investors not to sell because we had one of the most oversold markets in the last 30 years. And you, when you were down 24%, you were baking in the median decline around recessions. So what's happened since then? We've had this monster rally back up and uh, 17, 18%, as you mentioned. And I think part of the reason why that is, is, you know, our view is that recession risk wasn't, you know, the first half of this year, it's into, into next year. So now what we have done is the employment report came out, we revalued higher, uh, uh, inflation has been better than expected, revalued higher, earnings have been better than feared, revalued higher. But now at this level, we have a confluence of technical and fundamental resistance um, around an 18 multiple and also around the, the May highs and that 200 day moving average. Sure, you can overshoot because, the, you know, the one thing that's going good for this market is in, expectations are still really low and position is still a bit offside. But, you know, in order for you to say that this market should be at a higher value, um, I think you have to really be betting strongly on that, um, you know, that soft landing. And we have the, the you know, we have the, the, the most aggressive global central bank tightening cycle we have in 30 years. I just don't think that should be the base case. So at these levels, we would say if you're overweight equities, this would be a good place to trim back. I know that's somewhat of a crowded trade at this point, but we have to go by the evidence in John. So that's where we stand today. So Keith, talk to me about where you would trim, where specifically in this equity market you'd look to come back. Yeah, well, you know, we still think on a, on a relative basis that the U.S. is in a better position. We have a longstanding overweight to the U.S. because it's also a less cyclical market relative to over, uh, overseas markets. So we would still be underweight, um, developed international. We cut our exposure to actually zero in emerging markets earlier this year. So we still don't like that. And we'd also, at this point, especially on the short end of the curve where you're above 3 percent on, say, like a two-year yield, we think there's some opportunity to, to increase fixed income because at least yields are productive on the short end as well. And then more on a sector standpoint, John, we're still more defensively inclined. Uh, you mentioned uh, staples early in this segment. We still think that's an area, if the economy slows, that should hold up. Healthcare. And the one cyclical sector that we've still been in for over a year now is energy. And we still think that has a good um, kind of demand and supply dynamics in place. Keith, it's the energy story that I think confuses a lot of people when they hear that we've got this aggressive tightening cycle, we've got these risks to growth. In Europe, we're talking yep. about a recession. In China, we're talking about a real slowdown and the prospect of one materialising here in the United States as well. How does energy hold up in that world, Keith? How does it hold up? Yeah, normally, normally not very well. I, I think the only big difference, and I, you, know, you, don't, you don't want to say it's different this time, but is the supply dynamics and the geopolitical uncertainty that we're having overseas. And, and also, listen, there's been a secular shift that we haven't been investing in that area as much. So I think it is somewhat different. And it's also a hedge, in our view, to more of our defensive posturing. So we're thinking about this in a kind of a portfolio slash sector uh, composition. So listen, you mentioned that it was complex with Manchester. This is one of the most complex 
um, markets that I've seen in the last you know, 20, 20 plus years that I've been in there. But again, I think after this move up, the risk reward is just less favourable. Keith, I'm not going to ask you about Manchester United, don't worry. I am going to ask you about financial conditions, though, and tightening cycles. Yep. Keith, I think we forget that one of the biggest bubbles that we've ever seen in history, the subprime bubble, was blown up in a world when rates were climbing. And Keith, I just wonder whether this equity market can actually keep delivering in the face of tighter policy from this Fed until things just go pop. I'm not saying that we're there, and that's not what I'm trying to say. Keith, I'm just trying to say that financial conditions can ease in the face of a tightening cycle from the Fed. We've seen it before. Can we see more of it again? Yeah, I actually think, listen, I think the Fed has some scar tissue from what happened over the last year as far as inflation. And, you know, there's a lot of debate as far as, um, you know, if the Fed is going to start cutting rates early next year. And that's part of this market rally is kind of this revaluation based on, you know, maybe the terminal Fed funds rate uh, you know, peaking. That may be true, but uh, we, we think actually the Fed, because of that scar tissue, they're not going to cut as aggressively or at all in the first half as the market is expected. And that's a risk. And to the point about financial conditions, they've been saying directly they want tighter financial conditions. And what we have actually have, have seen over the last a uh, month or two is actually the complete reverse of that. So I think that's still a, a concern uh, for the overall market as we look at the months ahead. Keith, I want to keep exploring this theme of scar tissue and finish there. How powerful yeah. do you think the investor conditioning from the spring lows of 2020 are when they heard the same thing over and over again, that we're going to retest the lows, retest the lows, and they missed out on about 20 percentage points again, waiting and waiting and waiting, Keith? Do you think FOMO starts to kick in again? I think it's starting to kick in a little bit already. Listen, at the 2020 lows, we were we were urging investors to, to add to equities and to rebalance the other way. And we just had a price momentum signal, to be candid, that has been very powerful. When you go from indiscriminate selling to indiscriminate buying, we can measure that. That tends to happen after major lows. And, and that was one of the signals we talked about in 2020. What's holding us back from fully endorsing that signal, Jonathan, is that global central bank tightening is so aggressive. And... We have one of the, um, you know, the, the yield curve inversion is the deepest since about you know, 2000. So the conditions are, are different and you have this, you know, momentum on one side, but deteriorating monetary conditions and macro conditions on the other side. And that tells us not to be aggressive and not just to take a signal by itself. But I would say if, you, if you're looking for something to hang on to on the bull case, I think it's that price momentum and that FOMO because everyone's got kind of steamrolled here over the last month. Now, Keith, let's put a bow on it. Do you think the stage is set for Chairman Powell to push back next week? Yes, I think it's too premature for him to do anything different. Even if they thought inflation was coming down, why quit now? You know, you know, they want to see inflation squashed, and I don't see any reason why he would pivot, even if they think the data is softening somewhat. Keith, also want to catch up. Don't be a stranger. Let's talk soon. Keith Lerner there of Truist on the latest. He looked for that upside. We've got it. He's starting to get a little bit more cautious as we get closer to 4,300. Right now, 4,267. We're down about 8 tenths of 1% on the S&P 500. On the Nasdaq, we're down by 1.2%. Coming up, President Biden signing the Inflation Reduction Act into law. I'm about to sign the Inflation Reduction Act into law, one of the most significant laws in our history. Let me say from the start, with this law, the American people won and the special interests lost. That conversation, up next. We've not flinched and we've not given in. Instead, we're delivering results for the American people. We didn't tear down. We build up. We didn't look back. We look forward. And today, today offers further proof that the soul of America is vibrant, the future of America is bright, and the promise of America is real and just beginning. President Biden signing what they're calling the Inflation Reduction Act as gasoline prices keep sinking, posting their longest downward streak since 2018. Bloomberg's Anne-Marie down in D.C. for more. AMH, some good news for this president over the last couple of weeks. Yes, yeah, certainly is some good news. But, Jonathan, as you mentioned earlier in surveillance, it was kind of awkward the president started his speech talking about the fact that this was not a win for the special, in, special interests, even though to get this Inflation Reduction Act over the finish line, you had Senator Sinema really siding with Wall Street managers, hedge fund managers, VC leaders, in making sure that the carried interest provision stayed, did not go in the bill. So they reneged on that, which is definitely a special interest. 
But it is some good news for two reasons. One, they were able to show they were able to get this deal over the finish line in the sense that they have been talking about this since the start of the Biden administration. It was called Build Back Better. Now it's called Inflation Reduction Act. It is obviously so much smaller. At one point, they were talking about $10 trillion. But it has some wins that they can now go into the midterms campaigning on. And why that is important is because if you look at recent morning uh, consult and political poll, there is a lot of support for things in this bill, like lowering prescription drugs and also money to go towards renewables. So this is a huge win for them going into November. Hey, mate, just quickly, I don't think $4 gets it done at the pump, but is this a conversation that you just don't hear about anymore down in Washington? If they stop discussing it's- it? It's starting to evaporate because people are less concerned with the fact that gasoline is no longer in the fi- hovering around the $5 a gallon range. It is coming down. If you look at the AAA average, it's below $4 uh, a barrel. And in some places, it's actually much lower. So when you have gasoline prices coming down, that is giving them a little bit of breathing room because this for sure was the major concern when you looked at the polls. It was inflation, and obviously one of the biggest components of inflation uh, for everyday American consumers is energy prices and food. AMH, thank you. Is that a mistake to talk about the oil market in this way? We caught up with OPEC's newly appointed Secretary General. Take a listen to what he had to say. I think we are running on thin ice, if I may use that term, because spare capacity is becoming scarce. And this is an issue. It's like an insurance policy. Mm -hmm. We don't want the oil markets to run on without insurance policy. Julian Lee, awesome to catch up with you, sir. Awesome conversation with the OPEC chief and Manus Cranny. And he talked about this word scarcity. As we start to get comfortable with lower crude prices, lower gasoline prices, Julian, what's the signal from OPEC? And the signal is, um, as I think their new Secretary General made very clear, that they haven't got a lot more room to boost output if we need it. Um, and that, you know, that's a, a perennial worry. Uh, the market always gets jittery uh, when spare capacity within OPEC runs low. Um, it's very rarely been as low as it is now, um, if ever. Um, And that, that, you know, that is a cause for concern. And I think that's part of the reason that we've seen some very big um, daily swings in in oil prices. Uh, You know, 5 percent moves used to be um, as rare as hen's teeth. And now they're they're happening, you know, multiple times a week. Uh, And and this is part of the reason for that. And you add to that looming uh, EU sanctions on Russian oil, fears of recession. Will Iran come back? Uh, as a producer, will China come back as a consumer? Um, and you've got a lot of volatility in there. Julian, where is the Iran story now? It's been in the background for quite a while. Where is it? Yeah, I mean, at the moment, um, the European Union put this sort of last ditch proposal on the table. Um, it was billed as being a, a sort of, you know, take it or leave it uh, compromise agreement. Um, And if everybody didn't sign up to it, then essentially the whole process appears to be dead. Um, The Iranians have responded uh, in a way that certainly, uh, from what we've heard, seems positive. Um, The Americans and the the Europeans are now looking at it. Uh, We're expecting a a U.S. response uh, any day now. Um, And that will decide whether um, we go back to some kind of... Uh, agreement, as we had uh, before President Trump came into office, uh, that would allow uh, Iran to uh, start exporting its oil again in return for restrictions on its nuclear ambitions. And if we don't get that, then I think that the situation that we have at the moment persists. Hey, Julian, thank you. Julian Lee there, the latest on the commodity market, alongside Amory Horder and down in D.C., so, the gas story improves. Gasoline prices have come down. And because retail sales are a dollar figure, it is a dollar story, a nominal story. You have to kind of strip gas out to get a decent read, a better read of underlying demand in the economy for the U.S. consumer. X gas and autos, U.S. retail sales were pretty decent this morning. So that adds to the move at the front end of the yield curve. Yields up nine basis points on a two-year, 335. Yields up, stocks down. The Nasdaq down by about one full percentage point. The S&P down by three quarters of one percent. We will get you the trading diary in just a moment. That's next.
snap at a three-day winning streak on the S&P. We're down seven-tenths of one percent on the S&P 500. That's the price action. Here's the trading diary. The latest Fed minutes, two Eastern, a host of Fed speak coming up with Governor Bowman at 2.30. Then Esther George and Neil Kashkari on Thursday. Retail earnings continue to roll in. Coles and Ross reporting, followed by existing home sales and another round of jobless claims. From New York City, that does it for me. Thank you for choosing Bloomberg TV. This was the countdown to the open. This is Bloomberg.